Um, Rick is, he's been on the Nomadic Network a few times already, and he is one of my good friends from the travel industry, and he knows way too much about the countries of the world and all about these tiny countries that nobody really knows about. And so we're so excited to have him. And he's actually going to be leading the discussion with Dylan, who wrote this amazing book on Sealand. And I am just dying to hear what you have to say about this micro nation. <laughs> so take it away. I'll mute myself. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Good morning from Bangkok, everybody. I'm in the chat room. I want to say special hello to my neighbor, Emma in Singapore. So I'm not the only one here in Southeast Asia. And I'm also very impressed with Laura at Travel 80 by 80, who's been to 40 different nomadic network events. That's pretty impressive. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I, I wanna jump in immediately. Dylan, welcome. I am excited to hear about your journey of learning and discovery to the amazing and unique principality of Sealand. Before we dive into this very deep conversation, tell everyone what exactly is the principality of Sealand? Sure, uh, thank you everyone for having me. It's really real pleasure to talk about this. And um, yeah, so just to begin, I mean, the Sealand, which you can, uh, principality of Sealand is considered by many people to be the smallest country in the world. And as you can see, behind Rick, that is the entirety of the country. It's an entirely man-made uh, entity and it was declared to be its own territory in 1967. And since then has just, the whole adventure has re resulted in a pretty incredible series of battle schemes and adventures in the name of this fourth country. Yeah, it, it really is quite a story. And Dylan, where exactly is the Principality of Sealand. Where is this place? So this is in the North Sea, about just under seven miles from the southeastern coast of the UK, of England. Um, you can see it from the shore, uh, from this the small fishing village of Harwich, uh, but right next to it is Felixstowe, a pretty busy shipping port. So it's this really interesting uh, mix of old and new. But at any rate, that's where Sealand is. It's um, kind of outside of a shipping lane and it's a freestanding port seven miles out to sea. And just to add a note, which I found interesting during my visit, uh, Harwich is the launching point for the Mayflower ship that went to the US. And Dylan, tell me a little bit about yourself, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Dylan Taylor Lehman. I'm a writer and author originally from Southeastern Ohio, um, currently living in Mexico. Uh, I, the Sealand is the subject of my second book, which I'll shamelessly hype here, just called Sealand, uh, that's available now. Um, but generally, I'm a long form journalist and I've written about some offbeat crimes and interesting subcultures and uh, the history of some interesting foods too. So I just have an abiding curiosity for pretty much anything and fortunately have been able to write about it. Okay, and surprise, surprise, this book is available on Amazon. So check it out there. And I'd also like to introduce myself a little bit more. My name is Erica said, Rick Gazarian, and I am your host for this conversation. I am a travel blogger at Global Gaz, a podcaster, so you can subscribe there to Counting Countries. And I am on a uh, quest to travel to every country in the world. So far, I've been to over 140 countries, and you can also check me out on these links below if you have some time. And Dylan, I know there's 193 countries in the world, according to the UN. What exactly is a micronation? A micronation, which Sealand is justifiably considered the grandfather of is a territory or a country that's declared on lands that are within the boundaries of an established country. And some of these country, these micronations rather, have been declared for, uh, you know, just role-playing purposes or as a, you know, kind of political exercise, but some exist due to very serious and, and, and true uh, claims on disputed territory. So there are areas in the world that are kind of fighting for the recognition for a variety of reasons. Uh, Sealand is kind of unique in that it's an entirely man-made country 
and so that and it, it was built in genuinely international water so that kind of gives it a, a, a claim that not many micronations uh, can boast and speaking of uh, international waters principality of sealand is about seven miles off the coast of england or about 12 kilometers how, how do you actually get out to that country how do you get to the principality of sealand the only well first of all you, you know you would of course fly to london and take a train to harwich which is about two hours or so to the east uh it's very <laughs> quaint and nice little village to hang out in uh but at any rate there's a lot of shipping activity and fishing and so when i was able to visit i took uh this rickety old lobster boat piloted by some local fishermen on their way to ch to collect their lobster traps but they also had a system worked out where they would uh, ferried the caretaker on Sealand out to uh, begin his shift out there. So I rode out with them and was able to board Sealand along with the caretaker thanks to a uh, pretty rusty and loud mechanical winch that you can see dangling over the side in the background. And that's effectively the only way on the fort aside from a helicopter, which I did look into and it's like $5,000 a ride. So unfortunately outside of my abilities. Okay, and let's just emphasize this, Dylan. There's no staircase. There's no elevator. How many feet off is that platform? Uh, depending on the tide, it's about 40 to 60 feet. And, uh, you know, the boats can't really just hang it. When you're jumping off the boat, you it can't just hang out there lest it be pushed into the side. So as soon as you sit in the little swing that pulls you up, the boat pulls away and you're just dangling right over the notoriously rough North Sea. But, um, you know, it's kind of like a carnival ride. It's a lot more peaceful than it, it might look. And so I definitely enjoyed uh, being able to see the waters from that vantage point. So I, I think it's safe to say this is the only country in the world which is accessible by a winch and swing. Let's take a quick look and watch a quick video of how you journey to the Principality of Zealand. Sealand. I'm Prince Liam and this is Prince James. <laughs> And just as a side note, I made that very cool logo off Fiverr.com for surprise, surprise, $5. So I'm trying to get my money's worth out of that. <laughs> so Dylan, take me back. Actually, we're going to go back over 50 years. I want to learn about the history of Sealand and how and when was the country founded? Uh, long story short, the fort that would become Sealand was one of a series of fort built in the waters to defend England uh, from incoming Nazi bombers during World War II. Following uh, the conclusion of the war, it sat abandoned in these waters for about 20 years until the early 1960s when this uh, really impressive and fun and uh, rebellious era of British history took place called the Radio Pirate Era, uh, in which uh, people took to the waters to broadcast from stations such as these fort because of some radio restrictions in the UK at the time, which uh, I'm assuming we'll, we'll dive into now as well. well. Well, actually, let's touch on that because, you know, I've heard the term radio pirate before. I think there's a famous movie about that. But what, I, I mean, I have Spotify. I can listen to music wherever, whenever, whoever, whenever I want. So what, what is radio piracy all about? Well, back uh, up until the early 1960s, the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, had a monopoly on the airways, and they were the only licensed broadcaster in the UK. And so listeners across the country were totally at the mercy of what the BBC wanted to play. 
obviously rock and roll was taking hold and so a lot of young people were clamoring to hear this on the radio they wouldn't play it uh, aside from a few limited cases and so people began developing their own diy bootleg radio station and to get around uh, british laws against pirate broadcasting people simply took to the waters to international waters to set up these radio stations and as it happened there were a number of these abandoned forts in those waters that would make the perfect headquarters for radio stations that were genuinely outside of British jurisdiction. And so that's where this whole adventure began. So at some level, radio piracy was born by BBC's monopoly and for people's desire to hear the Beatles and the Rolling Stones when they wanted to hear the, the, these great rock bands back in oh, the day. Absolutely. And what year and how was the Principality of Sealand founded? Uh, the Principality of Sealand was founded by a man named Roy Bates, who was this larger than life adventurer, explorer, a World War II hero. He'd been blown up and stabbed and just been on all these crazy adventures, but said he loved being, <laughs> he loved being in the war and would do it again as soon as he was called. Uh, and once he came home, you know, of course, he was still trying to lead a life of excitement. And so he and his wife, Joan there, embarked in all these really interesting ventures such as uh, a rubber swim fin manufacturing facility, some butcher shops. Uh, but then when the pirate radio era rolled around um, in 1965, Roy took up, uh, you know, answered the call of radio piracy and decided to open a radio station. And since he lived near the, uh, on the shore near where these forts were, he knew that these uh, entities were available. And so he set his sights on one of these sports, but of course, a lot of people were interested in them too. And so another, uh, I mean, battles broke out for control of these structures. And when you say battles, you're not talking heated conversations. You're actually referring to physical battles between one radio pirate group and another radio pirate group over control of these uh, former military fortifications in the North Sea. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, as the radio pirate piracy phenomenon took hold, I mean, you know, some of these stations were raking in like tons of money and they were really widely popular, this huge deal. And so the stakes grew, obviously not a lot of freestanding forts in international waters. So they're pretty <laughs> in demand, but yeah, I mean, gunfights broke out, fist fights, people throwing Molotov cocktails at, uh, at boats, trying to raid these forts. Uh, you know, it finally, you know, once somebody got killed because of it, not on the forts, but rather on land in England, then the government really started to, to escalate, <laughs> you know, their efforts to clamp down on this phenomenon. And so Roy Bates was right in the thick of it, fighting off invaders for, you know, about a year and a half straight. Okay, so but how did we make this transition from being in the radio piracy industry to being the founder of the Principality of Sealand? Well, long story short, the BBC finally wised up and just realized, well, why don't we just open some more radio stations and play this music and then we wouldn't have to deal with all of this. And so that kind of came to a natural end. Uh, however, Roy Bates still maintained control of one of these forts and realized it was certainly something worth holding on to. And since some prior court decisions had affirmed that it was in international waters, he realized it would still, it still held tremendous value for whatever came next. And so in order to, uh, you know, really maximize that, he, just, he realized that <laughs> declaring it its own state would, you know, give it that extra, you know, be able to take it to the next level. And I don't know, can you take us to that day? This is, I think, in the late 1960s when uh, this, military fortification transitions into a independent nation? Yeah, actually it's the 53rd anniversary was just a couple of weeks ago on September 2nd. So September 2nd, 1967, there was, uh, as you can see on the cover of this book, a flag raising ceremony with family members and supporters. They raised the Sealand flag. They had some press out there to take some really cool photos of the event and yeah, just, you know, Shortly forthcoming would be a constitution, passports, coins, stamps, all of that. And so, you know, Roy was quite serious about, about using this uh, fort or treating this fort as if it were own, his own country and they got to- Yeah, so definitely uh, so many trappings of a real nation, which we'll talk about 
a little bit later. Now, Prince, uh, Prince Roy Bates had a son, Prince Michael, um, who was really involved with the founding of this nation. Tell me a little bit about Prince uh, Michael. Yeah, Prince Michael uh, was about 13 when the radio, when the, his, his dad opened his first radio station. And needless to say, you know, for a young boy being able to get in all these adventures and, you know, tinker with all this equipment and then get into fights, of course, and throw bombs at people was pretty appealing. And so, uh, you know, by the time he was 14, his parents let him drop out of school. He was in boarding school and spend full time on the fort. And so from his early teens, he was an integral part of the Sealand adventure and is essentially the patriarch of the family today. And he has kids of his own who are continuing it, it, on the tradition. It, it, uh, reading and learning about both Prince Roy and Prince Michael, it's, it's really difficult for me to decide which one is really the bigger character. But Prince Michael really fascinates me. As you just said, he dropped out at the age of 13 out of school. I mean, he is living such a unique life. Think about his peers who are going to school and playing soccer, football. Uh, at some level, Prince Michael grew up on this platform. Tell me what it's like living 50 years ago as a 13 or 14 or 15 year old on this very cold metal structure. Yeah, I mean, you know, needless to say, his, his, his friends were quite jealous that he got to do all this, but also it was tremendously lonely. I mean, he, as we discussed, you know, the only way on or off of the fort is via boat or helicopter. So once you're out there, you're really at the mercy of the weather when you can get off. And since the forts had been abandoned for 20 years by the time they reoccupied them, there were n absolutely no trappings of comfort at all. I mean, and so they slowly, slowly had to try to make it, you know, c c shut off where some of the air was coming in or weatherproof it. I mean, there's only so much you can do. And so, yeah, it was freezing cold out there. People passed out from the cold. Uh, when jets flew overhead, their drinking water tasted like fuel. And there were a few times when they were stuck out there so long that Michael had to distill seawater and mix with flour that he had to, and eat that to survive, he and his sister. So it was a pretty Spartan conditions for quite a while. And we, to, to put this into context, we said that the platform is, it's only seven miles off the coast of England. So, you, you know, we think of driving a car seven miles without traffic, that's a very quick ride. But touch a little bit more on what it means to take a boat into the North Sea and how it's at times virtually impossible to take the boat there and get into that swing and winch. Yeah, definitely. I mean, not only that, but where the Bates family lived, it was essentially a five hour trip from where their boat was docked you know, taking buses and walking down paths and finally getting in a boat, et cetera. So it was a five hour trip. But uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, the North Sea is notoriously rough. And so, you know, both Michael and, and his experience and the caretakers out there today say, you know, they might have planned to stay out there for two weeks, but six or seven weeks go by and you're still stranded out there. There's really not a lot you can do. And, you know, as tough and resilient as you are, you know, that's uh, that could be harrowing. And so definitely got to build up some significant character to, to stay out there. And the other thing to, to take into consideration, I mean, there's a big difference between 2020 and 1970. When you're out there in 1970, there's no TV, there's no internet, there's no cell phone. So seven miles, again, does not sound that far away. But at some level, it could be 700 miles. Definitely. Yeah, and you can see the lights twinkling from shore, which I don't know if that would be comforting or heartbreaking, but it's a nice view at least. And you've done a lot of research in writing this book. And again, I find Prince Michael to be absolutely fascinating that, you know, he's cut from a different cloth, that he's living this you know, I guess rewarding, but extremely challenging and different life. What's, what's a 15 or 17 year old's motivation for spending a month by himself or two months 
in the winter on this platform eating, you know, dry biscuits with distilled water. I mean, what's, what's that makeup, mental makeup that would drive him to spend all that time there? I mean, I, you know, I think the family in general, you got to just kind of have an inborn stubbornness to put up with something like this. And if it's as hard one as holding on to one of these sports, obviously you're going to want to hold on to it. But I also think that, you know, Michael really idolized his dad. And so I think there was this really intense sense of duty to the family and the, you know, once Roy and to a certain degree, Joan, um, Michael's mother, decided that this was what they were going to do that's that's what they were going to do and so there was this obligation sense of obligation to the family uh that shot shot through everything they did and then of course you know they really did have hopes for turning this into some kind of financial financially rewarding enterprise so there was always a serious effort to to turn this into something more than just like a <laughs> kind of bizarre hobby i guess and dylan <laughs> You spoke about some of the warfare during the radio piracy days before the Principality of Sealand was uh, declared. But Principality of Sealand itself has had a, I mean, tremendously interesting to bizarre history. So I want to kind of touch on a couple of those issues. Um, I know you shared with me there was a time of defending the platform. So I think uh, there were some boats that entered into the Principality of Sealand's water. So walk me through one of these early incidences. Yeah, and this was actually pivotal to Sealand's statehood. Uh, some British, some boats came to refill oil in one of the buoys that were close by. And of course, Michael uh, fired some warning shots at the boat across the bow to tell him, you know, you're in Sealand territory now. And so the next time that he and his dad were on the shore uh, back in the UK, he was arrested and they were charged with firearms offenses. And so, you know, this big day came and uh, it got knocked up a couple to a higher court. And so this big day came and the judge incredibly uh, ruled that because he, well, the fort that would become Sealand was outside of British jurisdiction. There was nothing the UK could do about them being out there, and they couldn't be prosecuted for these firearms offenses. And so that stunned even the Sealanders, but it also, you know, is one really significant ruling in favor of, um, you know, whatever the status of their territory is, which they, they and many supporters take to be statehood. Yeah, and just to emphasize what you just said, what you're stating is uh, British law does not rule over the Principality of Sealand because at that time, this platform was located in international waters. So in other words, you can, in essence, do what you want to do. I think there was another moment where uh, Prince Michael had a sister, Princess, was it Charlotte? Uh, Penny. Penny, Princess Penny. And I believe uh, someone looked at Princess Penny the wrong way when they're on the platform, a passing boat. Again, gun, <laughs> gunshots. So this preceded the uh, arrest for the, the other firearm fence I just mentioned. But yeah, again, you know, just demonstrating their seriousness about uh, their territory. Because at the time, international waters extended three miles. And since they were around seven miles, there was, there was no dispute that they were in international territory. Uh, since the founding of Sealand, there's been, I don't wanna say scheme, there's been one potential opportunity after the next opportunity next to the opportunity after that. People are always proposing ideas to the royal family and I, I believe at one point the government expanded in the 1970s. So take me to, I think it's 1976. Uh, well, a few years before that, in the early 1970s, the Bates family started working with this group of Germans and Dutchmen. And again, you know, this was after years of just all kinds of proposals. But for some reason, something about what these Germans were proposing stuck. They had all these really elaborate plans to expand the footprint of Sealand to be like a hotel, a coffee shop, resort, 
possibly even an oil drilling facility because there is oil in the North Sea, though as it turns out, not near Sealand. But uh, all that to say, uh, the Bates family started working with these Germans who were actually quite diligent about petitioning governments of pretty much every country in the world at that time for recognition, writing to the UN, really going out of their way to advocate for Sealand statehood. Uh, and that all was going well and good. Uh, the Bates family didn't know that these Germans um, were facing a variety of fraud charges back in the UK unrelated to Sealand, but the point is they were starting to work with some pretty slippery characters and that would come to light in 1978. Okay, and the Germans and I guess the Dutch seemed like good diligent partners initially, but I believe there was a coup d'etat. Yes, in, 19, in August 1978, Michael uh, was out alone on the fort, keeping watch because there always had to be someone out there to fend off uh, anybody interested in the fort. A helicopter lands, uh, some, some of these German guys get out that he recognized um, you know, from earlier. He got an uneasy feeling. They basically locked him in this iron closet, held him hostage, tied him up, you know, roughed him up a bit, and threw him into a boat, which dropped him off in Holland with no, <laughs> no money or a passport. And so they, you know, took over the fort. Michael ultimately made his way back to England, uh, told his parents what happened, who, uh, you know, they were originally pretty pissed off that he didn't do more to hold on to the fort, but they hatched a plan to retake to coup d'etat, the coup d'etat. And so uh, as it happened, uh, Roy Bate, Prince Roy was friends with a guy who was a stunt helicopter pilot who'd flown in some James Bond movies and they you know cobbled together some odd you know pistols Roy had left over from the war a hunting rifle and flew out to the fort to retake it and the the pilot noted that he was ecstatic that he was on a real raid <laughs> this time instead of just being in the movies but yeah they treated it like a like a real assault despite never having done anything like this quite like this before I, I mean this really does show I mean you can make all the jokes you want. This is incredibly serious business. You just described two military helicopter assaults uh, within a month. And from my understanding, the counter coup for the royal family to reclaim the Principality of Sealand, I mean, they literally repelled off the helicopter, landed on the platform with weapons raised. And what happened when they, they touched down on the platform? I assume the Germans are shocked. What goes on? I didn't think, yeah, they definitely weren't expecting it. So there was no, no shots fired except maybe an accidental discharge when Michael jumped out of the helicopter and hit the deck. But uh, they retook control of the fort and of course quickly imprisoned these Germans. There is at the bottom of one of the legs uh, a jail cell, an iron door with bars cut in it. So they kept them down there for a bit uh, and eventually negotiated their release, sent a couple of them home, but they put one guy on trial because he had been issued a Sealand passport and was therefore guilty of treason. And so, uh, yeah, they, they put him on trial in front of some reporters. Okay, so uh, tried for treason, he was considered a citizen uh, of the Principality of Sealand. How long does he spend in prison or how does he get out of this mess? I mean, again, we've described a very cold, dank, uncomfortable place. I mean, prison isn't fun to begin with. It might be doubly unfun in a dungeon in one of those platforms legs. How does he get out of this mess? Well, he was sentenced to six months imprisonment and an $18,000 fine, which neither of which uh, he had to serve. I mean, he was made to basically clean the toilet, make coffee, do odd jobs and stuff like that. But he did start to go a little stir crazy. And in the book, there's a, uh, uh, an interview he gave to a no local newspaper reporter where it's just hilarious how, <laughs> how he's just kind of going crazy out there. But anyway, they eventually realized he was being too annoying. And so they granted him clemency and they released him on the shore. And uh, he later actually served as their lawyer because he, he was a lawyer in real life. He served as their lawyer for another case, but it all ended uh, pretty peacefully despite the beginnings of the coup. 
Okay, well, he's quite fortunate that the royal family uh, granted him clem clemency. Now, oh, I, wait, I should know, this is like a major point too for Celian's independence. To negotiate his release, the British government sent a member of the German embassy in London to Sealand to negotiate his release. And so obviously supporters look at this, at the German government sending an actual dignitary to Sealand as another uh, acknowledgement of Sealand's status as a sovereign nation. Yeah, so that that's kind of the second big example that you yeah. shared with us. The first yeah. one being uh, when Prince Michael shot at nearby boats, he could not be prosecuted. It was international waters. Mm -hmm. And again, um, Principality Sealand imprisoned somebody. They didn't get in trouble for that. In fact, they got more attention as a German dip diplomat had to negotiate with the royal family to secure the German citizens release from the Principality of Sealand. Yeah. To me, this is about as fascinating as you can get. There's controversy after amazing story after controversy. Take us to the mid 1990s. And you had mentioned a couple times that Sealand uh, has its own passport. So describe what happens in the mid 1990s with passports. Uh, so as it turns out, this, the Germans who led the coup in 1978 were led by this guy named Ale Alexander Achenbach. And he would stay in the, sh in the background and declare himself to be the leader of the Sealand government in exile, which still exists to this day and is an extreme, even weirder and more extreme side note to all this. But anyway, so as, as I said before, the, these Germans were pretty accomplished uh, fra con artists and fraudsters. And so in the 90s, it came to light that there was this huge international ring of people selling bootleg, bootleg sealand passports, doctorates, all, like medical titles, all this stuff from uh, putative sealand institutions. And so they managed to carry off a pretty, a pretty amazing amount of fraud, uh, even going so far as to try to buy private planes with sealand government bonds, uh, and even buying and selling missiles from the Russian mob to Sudan, who was at war at the time. And so totally without the Sealand family's knowledge, this like cottage industry of bootleg Sealand documents sprung up. And that all uh, came to light, uh, to, came to the Sealanders attention in 1997, when one of these passports was found uh, on the houseboat where the guy who killed Gianni Versace committed suicide. And so all of a sudden, Sealand was tied into the assassination of Gianni Versace uh, because the guy who owned the houseboat was connected to these Germans and just had all these fraudulent documents aboard. And so obviously, Sealand had nothing to do with any of this. And the, the Bates family, Prince Roy, were just aghast that this had happened um, you know, under Sealand's name. But it just all that goes to show kind of if you know how to work these documents and you know aspects of officialdom you can get pretty far with that so, so dylan i mean th this is such a strange situation so for instance you gave us that example johnny versace is assassinated by andrew kunanen uh kunanen is hiding out on a host houseboat in miami the police arrive and they find this sealand document oh. I mean, you know, we see a passport from Russia or United Kingdom. We know what we're looking at. What's, what's law enforcement think when they see they're rifling through the documents and they see this uh, very official looking passport? What, what happens? All the instances that I've found where, that, where that's happened, where someone's claimed to be a Sealander or they found these documents, you know, the authorities are obviously baffled and they get a hold of the British government who just kind of like <laughs> sighs and shakes their head and they're like, no, we don't recognize that. That's not a real thing to us, blah, blah, blah. And so unfortunately people don't get very far with that, though there are instances where, um, you know, kind of people have slipped through the cracks and been given visas and their Sealand passport and other, other things like that. And, and Dylan, you're talking about this, it sounds like a pretty wide 
statewide fraudulent uh, scheme? I mean, mm -hmm. can you, is there any scale that you can describe? Was it, you know, a hundred passports produced and a million dollars of revenues or what were they selling these passports for? Can you, can you put some scale to, to this uh, fraudulent event? Yeah, I mean, it was thousands of passports sold for thousands of pounds each. I think there, at the time, Hong Kong was changing hands or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure the intricacies of that situation, but they're being sold to, uh, you know, kind of exploiting people in that situation by selling them these passports uh, and that, that among their other uh, fraudulent activities, millions of dollars, people from countries all over the world. Um, yeah, it was really, really a massive and surprisingly extensive uh, fraud ring. Dylan, during the uh, writing of this book, I mean, you did real intensive research going into archives. Um, for those who follow CLN history, I know there's, there's not that many, but for those who do, they probably know the stories that we just discussed today. Mm -hmm. But is there any sort of uh, thing, interesting anecdote or story that popped up during your uh, archive research? I mean, one thing that really surprised me was just how serious the British government was taking the Bates family's occupation of the fort. I mean, in the archives, uh, you know, they have 20 page long extensive uh, dossiers on like military raids of the fort involving helicopters and Marines and just numerous raids were planned out and canceled at the last minute. But they, you know, because of just how nebulous this situation was. Um, you know, it looked like the government was, was willing to take some pretty serious steps to uh, get rid of it, although they canceled all of these plans because they realized that either a sea lander or someone from the government would probably get killed and they didn't want the PR fiasco that would result. Uh, but they also tried things like, I mean, buying off Roy, the government offered him 5,000 pounds if he would just knock it off and he countered with 100,000 pounds, which would, you know, probably million something these days uh and they also tried to get a former radio pirate who worked with roy to turn against him and and, and steal the fort from under him which didn't go well either so yeah it, it, the funny thing was that just the bates family always seemed to triumph in these situations uh you know just kind of a comedy of errors from the british government's part it in the other interesting note, I think, Dylan, of, of all this is, is Sealand, which was just one family, you know, the Bates royal family. I, I mean, we're not talking 100 people, 1,000 people, or 10,000 people. It's really just a, a handful of people. But regardless of that, this went up to some high levels within the British government. I mean, this is what, getting the attention of many high officials. Yeah, I mean, the, the prime minister at the time, you know, requested to be updated with whatever was going on. And yeah, I mean, the the letters just fly back and forth between all these different high level, levels of government. And it's it's really, it was entertaining to read uh, just the tone of these letters, because some of them would be mad, some of them would be exasperated or sarcastic, like they just couldn't believe what a ridiculous situation this was, which was true. And nobody really knew quite what to do about it. And then again, the Bates family seemed to triumph at every turn and they were darlings of the local press. So they had all the popular support. And so it, it all just fortunately kind of worked out in their favor. Dylan, we saw the video earlier. And for those who are paying attention, they might've noted that Prince James and Prince Liam we're welcoming us to the Principality of Sealand. So they are the third generation, the sons of Prince Michael, the grandchildren of Prince Patty Roy Bates. And now they are getting involved uh, with the uh, ownership or leading the Principality of Sealand. Tell me a little bit about these two princes. Yeah, as you can see, these uh, handsome chaps are the, the current generation of Sealanders that they have are uh, James, who's on the left in the photo, has uh, kids of his own, so the fourth generation of Sealanders. But they're quite knowledgeable about the internet, obviously, and know how to use that to their advantage. And so they're, they've been instrumental in really 
uh, popularizing Sealand over the past decade or so and are responsible for the the title, the royal titles you can buy and really amplifying Sealand's story. And so uh, thanks to their hard work, you know, kind of for the first time in Sealand's history, it's achieving Roy's dream of being a self-sufficient enterprise because before, you know, the Bates family had to sell furniture. Michael lost his house. They got divorced because of just how much effort went into maintaining the fort. But finally, um, it's, it's, it's self-sustaining and that's definitely a load off their minds and has only been good for the Sealand story. And, and Dylan, I don't want to brag too much here, but I was fortunate enough to drink tea with uh, both of these princes at, during my visit to the Principality of Sealand. D Dylan, I, I mean, for those who were of the Principality of Sealand, I mean, there's almost, I mean, there's an incredible cult-like following uh, for the royal family, for the Principality of Sealand. Mm -hmm. um, so in some circles, I mean, whether it's Prince Michael or these two gentlemen here, I mean, they're held, held in extremely high regard. But in the same light, I mean, they're living normal lives as well with uh, other business. So how do these, how's the family kind of work their way in between being uh, part of a royal family, but yet at the same times, normal, regular, dual citizens of the United Kingdom as well. Yeah, I mean, well, back in the UK, the Bates family runs a business that harvests these small edible mollusks called cockles, which are quite a delicacy, I'm told. And so I did try some kind of taste like, you know, rubbery clams, nothing too impressive from my perspective. But, uh, you know, they own uh, a fishing fleet and a canning factory, so they tend to that in their, their day to day life. But uh, yeah, they are occasionally recognized as being those Sealand guys. Uh, it's definitely, you know, a little awkward if you <laughs> overly, you know, treat them like royalty. But yeah, they get acknowledged from time to time. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny, they were telling me like, you know, when they start dating someone new, they have to kind of like go over like, all right, how do we break break to them that, you know, my family has this like really weird legacy behind them. But as it turns out, a lot of times people have heard of it already. And so they kind of ease into it. But definitely the local papers had a lot of fun uh, when James got married, you know, making, uh, talking about how, uh, you know, his wife to be would now be a princess and things like that. Uh, definitely a unique wedding announcement, I can imagine. Sure. Uh, you touched on this before, Dylan, but Sealand has so many trappings of a real nation, a constitution, a flag, which you can see right here, um, passports at one time, coins, stamps. Talk to me a little bit about these trappings of a nation. Uh, yeah, they the Sealanders embarked on on issuing stuff like that. Uh, basically, as soon as the country was founded, one of the first things they did was mint some coins and, and real silver coins, and they've consistently issued new coins uh, throughout the succeeding decades. They also issued their first stamps in 1969, which they had they had an arrangement with this guy from Belgium who was going to fly to Sealand in a helicopter, get a mail bag fly it back to Belgium and enter it into the Belgian postal system with Sealand stamps. And so fortunately uh, that didn't work out. I mean, you, you know, that doesn't work with the international postal service. So uh, some, some letters slip through, but uh, you can't unfortunately use Sealand stamps now, but uh, they do. Yeah. Of course, maintain all of the trappings of statehood to this day. Okay. So we're looking at a picture of the Sealand visa. So, do you need a visa when you're visiting the Principality of Sealand? Yep. Yeah. When I, I, I absolutely, uh, you know, pleaded for my passport to be stamped with a Sealand stamp. And, but yeah, so once you get uh, onto the fort, we went into the customs office, AKA the kitchen table. And as you see in that photo, they stamp your passport and that's, uh, I have a ceiling stamp in my passport. And I secretly hoped that that would cause some commotion at a border, but nobody really paid it any attention. So, uh, yeah. And here is a picture of the Sealand flag. Um, 
I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you know what these colors represent in the flag? Uh, yeah, it's black is for radio piracy. Uh, white is for the path of purity they endeavor to walk, which they said was tongue in cheek. And I think red was for, I should know this, uh, you know, the sense of adventure or something like that. So um, there, yeah, there is meaning behind the flag. Okay. And one of the other, I think, you know, the ways countries project power and recognition is through sports and athletics. So, um, you know, for instance, my understanding is the flag of Sealand has been to the summit of Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, some of the Mount Everest. Well, this is on a, a, another guy who I talked to in the book took this to a really high mountain in Asia, which he unfurled at the top there. But Sealand's been represented in all kinds of uh, sports, obscure and uh, regular <laughs> alike. I mean, they have a soccer team that some celebrities have played on as a benefit. They've competed. A, a guy won a martial arts tournament in Canada under the Sealand flag. Sealand's taken the champion, uh, the top place in the 2008 egg throwing championship or something like that. So. Uh, yeah, people have been really uh, interested in competing on behalf of Sealand and, you know, bringing glory to the flag, as you can see there. Okay, and w when it comes to royalty at the Principality of Sealand, it's, it's quite limited. There's, I think, you know, several princes and princesses, um, but all of us can become part of the royal family. So, Dylan, how can I become a lord? How can you become a Duke? Tell me about how to be involved as part of the Royal family of the Principality of Sealand. Sealandgov.org is the official website of the Sealand government. And so you can buy all, you know, stuff like coffee mugs and t-shirts and things like that. But more importantly, you can also buy noble titles and for various prices, uh, you could be a Lord, a Duke, Duchess, uh, a, I don't know if they have knighthoods, possibly baron baroncies. So yeah, and all of that, of course, goes to maintaining the fort. Okay, so let, I'm going to use that as an excellent segue, maintaining the fort. And you touched on this a little bit before as you described how their um, cockerel business is helping support the fort. Um, but you're also saying it's you know self-sufficient. Is this an expensive undertaking, maintaining the fort? Is it money making? Is it money losing? Share with us how that works a little bit. Uh, I mean, you know, they were understandably unwilling to divulge the gross domestic uh, income or expenses of the country. However, uh, they did say that, again, that it's, it's self-sustaining now, and that includes paying two caretakers as their full-time jobs to stay on the fort and take care of it. And so they alternate two week shifts, whether depending of course, uh, but yeah, all the proceeds uh, go, go to not only paying the caretakers, but also, you know, re-welding the decks or painting or bringing out new bits of furniture or, or you know, generator parts and stuff like that. And I think two of the unsung heroes of the history of the Principality of Sealand, you just mentioned them. I think their official titles from what I was told are the Directors of Homeland Security, mm -hmm. AKA the Caretakers. So at this point, I mean, Prince Liam, Prince James do not live at the Principality of Sealand. They make visits. Prince right. Michael in his day lived there for months on end, but it's really these two director of Homeland of securities are shouldering a lot of this, this effort. So let's give them some credit where credits do. Tell me a little bit about them. Yeah. One, one guy is named Mike. Uh, he is, he's been involved with the Bates family for like 30 years. He was a radio pirate in the seventies. Cause that, uh, some other side story that extended that long. So he's definitely, you know, kind of in the mold of a true Sealander. And he's just really a, a technical genius. I mean, he's rigged up all of the renewable energy 
supplies that are out there. He, he's just a tinkerer and a builder and a really smart, dedicated guy. So he's one of the people out there. And then the other guy is named Joe, who's just this like super gregarious, friendly guy who's been involved with sealing for about 10 years. And he fell into it. Uh, he, prov he was asked to provide security during a Red Bull skateboarding event that was filmed on the fort. And so he'd never been out there at the time and was like just utterly terrified. But then the peculiar charm of the place really set in. And so he's been um, an avid uh, caretaker, director of Homeland Security uh, for about 10 years. And they both say, you know, of course, it really takes a certain kind of person to to be able to deal with that. But if you're at home in your own mind and like your own time and just time to to build or read or they drink a lot, <laughs> they tend to drink a lot out there, you know, by all means, uh, that's the job for you. Okay, Dylan, the book, I read it, it is awesome. And, but what was, I mean, this is a odd asterisk in, you know, geography or world history. What, what was your inspiration to dedicating, you know, over a year of your life to writing this book? Uh, I, I mean, I first heard of Sealand, I don't know, well over 10 years ago, and I heard about it sort of through the stories about the exile government, which I, I chronicle in the book, but long story short, they're just con artists of the highest magnitude, but they're interested in like Nazi UFO technology and harnessing this mystical energy source called Vril, and so it's just totally weird. Again, not having anything to do with the Sealanders, but anyway i found out about sealand that way read about the radio pirate history and just all that the families put into it all these just fascinating side stories and you know that seemed exactly like the book i would want to read and so i just uh was able to to be tasked with writing it and dylan as we mentioned before i mean the principality of sealand is an obsession for many around the globe how did you break through with your proposal to the royal family i mean i i started pestering them years ago just with with questions or just to to talk to them uh and then when i started pitching a book idea you know they were a little wary because prince michael has authored and self-published the sealand has self-published his own autobiography and so he was a little wary of the competition from my book but i you know kind of pitched it to him like this is like or yours is an autobiography. This is like a the a history book, or a, you know, a more journalistic history of it. And so they agreed to to talk with me for it. And so, um, just I, I eventually, you know, kind of proved that I, my my um, intentions were pure. And so when I went to England to do a bunch of research, I was able to arrange some interviews uh, with Michael and his sons and and Penny Bates, Michael's sister, who hasn't really been in the spotlight for about 50 years because she kind of disassociated herself with it uh, for a while. But yeah, I was able to do all kinds of cool research and they worked well with them on that. It, after reading, watching videos, thinking about researching, what was it, what was it like to finally meet Prince Michael? I mean, he's such an incredible character. Yeah, I, I mean, it was clearly, uh, you know, very nerve wracking. I was definitely like hyping my, you know, hyping myself up before I went to his apartment to meet with him. Uh, but yeah, he's just a born storyteller. I mean, in that photo, you can kind of see uh, the kind of person you might be talking to. But uh, he did open the door and call me his nemesis as the first thing due to our possibly competing natures of the book. But then he took me inside and showed me all kinds of cool artifacts and answered all these really nitpicky questions I had. So it was really nothing short of a dream come true, let alone setting foot uh, on Sealand. It, Dylan, we, you, you shared the history of Sealand. You explained how Prince Michael could not be prosecuted for shooting at nearby boats. You described how a German diplomat had to go to Sealand to negotiate the release of a German citizen. So at the end of the day, and, and then we've discussed passports, coins, stamps, national anthems, constitutions, visas. So my question, is Principality of Sealand a country? Uh, I'm going to sidestep a hard answer on that. Uh, I would say in the minds of supporters, it absolutely is. 
And I think that, you know, really pinning down its, its legal status is part of the story, but also, um, you know, it just, it's such an interesting case because there is no straight answer on it. I mean, countries are, de are declared and recognized uh, fairly inconsistently. There's, there are some standards, but those aren't evenly applied. And so definitely on paper, at least Sealand has a pretty valid claim to statehood. I mean, whether it can hold its own next to other countries isn't really the point, but rather, um, you know, a lot of the, the supporters kind of hinge on these technical uh, qualifications. But again, it's enduring history, 53 years at this point, plus the radio pirate era before that, uh, all that it's, it's accomplished, it certainly, uh, you know, has forged for itself a pretty interesting identity that, again, some see it as a country, some don't, but the fact is it, it absolutely exists and continues to exist, and that's uh, cool enough, I guess. Okay, Dylan, well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Nomadic Network and sharing the amazing history of the Principality of Sealand. Do you have a final word to share with us? No, I, yeah, I really appreciate uh, being able to talk about this. Again, I, I find myself being oddly one of the most knowledgeable people probably about this, so I'm glad to, to be able to, uh, you know, put together a repository of Sealand history, so definitely check that out. Uh, there's a, a blog of my writings uh, about a number of things, the yawningchasm.com. So feel free to check that out. And I'm on in Instagram at Shakespeare underscore sucks. Okay. And as you guys can see, uh, Erica, our excellent producer, sharing with us his website, his Instagram, as we mentioned before, you can purchase the book on amazon.com or other great book retailers. And for those of you who love the simplicity of a QR code, you can take a quick snap at that. Uh, so at this point, uh, we'll see if there's any questions. There was one I noted um, who asked, uh, have any royal members of the United Kingdom or leaders, in other words, uh, Queen Elizabeth or Boris Johnson, have any of them found their way to the Principality of Sealand? Uh, n unfortunately, no recognized world leaders have, though a number of celebrities from the UK and, and globally have set foot on the floor to broadcast from there or offered their support in some capacity. So there is some pretty high level uh, you know, recognition for sure. It, what, who are any well-known celebrities? Was it Posh Spice who made her way there? Or? Uh, I think if I lived in, in England, I might be a little more hip to these people. I mean, some, some BBC presenters, I think a soccer star. Uh, I know, um, what's the, the red-haired singer songwriter? Ed Sheeran. Uh, okay. He was given a, a barren scene, so he tweeted about it. So I'm sure a bunch of his followers, <laughs> you know, looked into it. And I, I guess one question, how do you visit the Principality of Sealand? Can everybody on this Zoom call book a trip, take a lobster boat and get their passport stamped? Unfortunately, no. I mean, you know, all COVID restrictions aside, uh, I definitely had to work at gaining their trust for a while. I mean, you know, clearly this is a pretty uh, in-demand thing to do. And for liability reasons and a number of other reasons, they, you know, it's not, you, you can't, it's not that easy to arrange a trip. So I think fortunately just by kind of uh, talking with them for, you know, years before I visited, I was able to, to pull this off. So uh, sadly it's not, no, no Airbnb out there yet. Okay. Well, I want to thank you again and I'm going to turn it over to Erica.